Well, good morning and uh, welcome to the Whitefield Baptist Church Sunday School time. Uh, it's Easter Sunday. What a day of rejoicing today. Today is April the 4th and the day I'll be taking uh, our lesson will be coming from John chapter 20 verses uh, 3 through 9, 19 through 23, and 27 through 29. Uh, if you uh, have your Bibles, you can turn there. If you have your Sunday school books, you can turn to your, in your Sunday school books to the lesson for April the 4th, the resurrection of Jesus. What a glorious day. Today, people all over the world are celebrating that Jesus Christ is risen. Uh, all over the world this week, there have been people have been celebrating Holy Week and uh, the time of, of Jesus' uh, uh, entry into Jerusalem and... Uh, the people went from singing hosannas and until calling for his crucifixion. So it's all over the world this week are celebrating this historic event. And the way it culminated was on Easter Sunday when he arose from the grave. So that's what we celebrate today. Jesus is riding, rising from the dead. Um, this is the central event of the whole Bible. This is what the Bible is has, uh, is based on, uh, the gospel is based on is the, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as our Savior. Jesus' resurrection uh, took everyone by surprise. Even those that uh, he, he had uh, told about it, uh, his enemies had heard him say that he would, but uh, he had predicted it, but people still didn't believe it. Um, they put Roman guards at the tomb to assure that uh, he could not, that he would not rise from the grave. But the, as they put the Roman soldiers there to guard the tomb, uh, they wanted to make sure that that uh, the the his followers, the disciples, or someone of, of his followers would not come and steal the body from the grave. And and but none of his followers were even there. Uh, they weren't even present to see the resurrection except for John, although they heard him uh, to see his, re his death on the cross. Uh, and they weren't there that Sunday morning to, to experience his resurrection, although they had, although they had heard him teach it, and, and, and he had taught it to them many times that he would die and rise the third day. But nobody was there. But some of the women came that morning uh, and to... to uh, to put the ointment on the body. They came to complete the burial process for his body, which showed that uh, even they didn't believe that Jesus would arise from the grave as he said he would. Uh, and But when they got there, his body was gone, and there stood the, the tomb was open, and two, two men in radiant clothing uh, told the women that Jesus was not there, but that he had risen. Uh, they re This reminded them, they reminded them these these two Two people who stand in there, uh, two angels, reminded these ladies of what Jesus had told them in Galilee about being crucified and rising on the third day. Uh, and then they remembered his words. And you can look back at Luke 24, verses 5 through 8, to see that those words and that, that, that episode there. Um, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, and that he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet he shall still live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. John eleven twenty five through 26 were the words of Christ. A lot of times these words are used to give comfort to families who have lost loved ones. But behind these words is the reality of who Jesus Christ really is. That he is a living Lord of life, of mine and your life. His resurrection is, the, is a fact. And all who place their faith in him will have the promise of eternal life, never dying, but going to be with our Savior there in heaven. When we, when we look at these verses that we're going to study today, uh, we, we find these women that came to the tomb to, uh, to complete the burial process of the body of Christ. But what they found and what they saw rocked their world, and it changed everybody's world forever when they experienced what they what Jesus had told them would happen. Um, the, 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 the energy empty tomb of Easter, Easter has been uh, shaking the foundations of history ever since. Uh, 
and, and if people will listen to the word and believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and accept him and, and come to know him as their Savior, then this, this story of the resurrection just gives us more hope and more proof that Jesus is who he said that he was. So we'll begin here in uh, John chapter 20, and I'll read verses 3 through 9, and then we'll discuss those. Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple and came to the sepulchre. They ran, they, so they both ran together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and he came first to the sepulchre. And he stooping down and looking in, he saw the linen clothes lying, yet went in he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and he went into the sepulchre, and he seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but was wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went also in another, uh, the other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and they, he saw and he believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the grave. Verse 3 tells us that when the women went and told uh, Peter and John about, about the, the, the grave being emptied, uh, it said, Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple. Well, John is the other disciple. A lot of times John did not he in, in his in the verse scripture that he wrote he did not refer to himself as john but he would also he would sometimes refer to himself as the other disciple or the disciple one of the disciples of whom jesus loved he would refer to himself in other ways so here john is referring to himself when he talks about peter and the other disciple they they left and they went to the sepulchre the place of the tomb um John, on, on the night of Jesus' rest, John and Peter, all the other disciples fled, but John and Peter followed Jesus to watch what was going on. Now, John followed at a distance, but Peter followed from afar. And Peter, you know, uh, was questioned three times, and Peter denied Christ three times. But John was the only disciple that stayed through the whole process of the, res the beatings, the trials, and, and then the actual... Uh, crucifixion there at the cross. Uh, it's no surprise that Peter and John uh, remained together, hiding in the wake of Jesus' Christ's death and burial. And as John spoke to Mary Magdalene, um, she had told him how she had been to the tomb earlier that morning and that the body was missing. The stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty. And Peter and John ran toward the tomb um, I don't know why he and Peter had remained together or if they were with the other disciples and they ran and the other disciples didn't move. But I don't know the details of that, but I do know this, that Peter and John ran to the tomb to see what was, to see what was going on for himself. Verse 4 and 5 says, And they ran together. And the other disciple, John, he, he outran Peter. And they came to the, to the place of the tomb. And he says that John was stooping down and looking in. He saw linen clothes lying there, yet he went not in. See, John arrived there first, and John stooped and looked into the tomb. And uh, But he, he didn't go into the tomb. He said he, he stopped at the entrance of the tomb, and he, he, he looked in. He looked at, he saw the linen. He looked at the linen. The term, same term uh, used for Mary Magdalene, verse 1 Neither John nor Mary Magdalene entered the tomb at first. The stone was not rolled away to let Jesus out of the tomb. And a lot of times people will say that that was the reason. But the stone, was, Jesus could have moved the stone. Jesus could have walked through the stone. Jesus could have released himself from the tomb at any time. But the stone was rolled away so that others could see that he was no longer there in the tomb. Uh, Jesus was no longer held by the grave. Uh, and it would prove later that day that he could appear and disappear as he pleased when he appeared in the room with the disciples. Uh, the stone covering was no ob obstacle for him. The stone was removed to let outsiders into the tomb. And as the women and disciples discovered, an empty tomb identified and testified to a risen Savior. And that's what we, we celebrate today is the empty tomb on Easter Sunday that he was no longer there, but he had arisen from the grave. Verses 6 and 7 says that 
Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and he went into the, to the tomb, and he seeth the linen cloths lying there. And he saw the napkin that was about his head, but it was not lying with the linen clothes, but it was wrapped together in a place by itself. Peter was not as cautious as John. As you know, Peter was quite outspoken. Uh, even when Jesus would tell him that he would deny him, Peter uh, said that he would never deny Jesus, that he would die for him. Uh, you know, Peter is also the one who, when they came to capture Jesus, or take Jesus, uh, Peter was the one who drew his sword and cut off the ear. He had a real brash personality, so Peter did not uh, hesitate to go into the tomb. He was not afraid to speak or act uh, on his feelings, and he acted and spoke in the way that he saw fit. So it makes sense that Peter would not be satisfied just looking from the outside, but Peter wanted to go into the tomb and investigate, find out what this was, this open tomb. He said that he seeth, indicates that he noticed, he looked at, uh, the, the things in the tomb. Uh, the body was gone, but the grave clothes were still there. The linen cloth that had covered Jesus' head was now was now folded and placed at the top of the head. Uh, the, the outer covering that had had uh, been wrapped around Jesus to, to his body was was laying there as though it was only a shell of his body. It was just the, the cloth laying there as though Jesus had been had come out of the cloth. The napkin that had been around his head was folded neatly and it was set all by itself. All that seems like odd information to be, to be given. And those facts alone uh, could be considered odd. But these facts were actually the proof that John gives us that Jesus arose out of the grave. You see, no one would have, if someone had come and taken his body, they would not have left the grave clothes. If someone had come to steal his body, they would not have folded the napkin at the top and laid it there for others to find. Um, there were, they were, these are two of the greatest proofs that, that John had that Jesus was resurrection. Um, a lot of people have always said that Jesus' body was stolen or that he hadn't really died, that he was just in a, in a daze or, or had, had fainted and, and he awoke and come forth. But it makes little sense to, to unwind the clothing around the body before stealing it. And then the cloth wasn't unwound and laying as we would think you would if you unwound the clothing, but it was there as the outer shell of his body. Um, his, if it, his body had been stolen, then the grave clothes would probably have been taken as well. If Jesus had been asleep and or fainted and come to, he would have taken the shell off and, and not left it there the way it was. they found it. It would make not make sense to... to uh, for, for thieves to unwind the clothing around the body and leave it there before stealing. Likewise, uh, Jesus um, would have uh, not left the, the, wrap, the wrappings just the way he did and folded the napkin. So the orderly presence of the grave um, clothes indicated that something miraculous had happened in that, in, in, in that tomb that morning. The fact that Jesus was not there the fact that the grave clothes were left in the condition that they were was proof to John that Jesus had arisen from the grave. Verse 8, it says that then went out and also the other disciple, and that would be John, which came the first one to the tomb, and he saw and he believed, for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the grave. John followed Peter's example, and he went into the tomb he, he saw the grave clothes. He saw the empty tomb. He observed all the things that, that Peter had seen. Um, he took it all in. Uh, the, the young disciple believed what he saw. And belief is a primary theme throughout uh, the John's gospel. But in any case, it was not clear exactly what he believed. He certainly believed that Mary, what Mary had told him, the body was no longer there. Uh, she had reported an empty tomb, and it had caused much confusion uh, because Jesus' body wasn't there. So it's surely he believed that because he could see and he could relate to that confusion. But John also believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. Uh, John believed in the resurrection to the full extent of the faith that he had in the moment. The understanding that he had, of course, would grow stronger with more time and more experience as he experienced the days to come with Christ. What the young disciple believed made no rational sense. And what he saw didn't offer any real explanations. But they believed. 
John admitted that disciples did not know the scripture. Um, this provided to the key to everything around them. Jesus himself had told them on many occasions that he would die and that he would be buried and that again on, and on the, he would rise again on the third day. Jesus had told them that. In addition, the Old Testament prophecies had said the same thing uh, about the Messiah. In Psalm 16:10 it was predicted. In Isaiah 53, 10 through 12, it was talked about. But whether limited by ignorance or grief, Peter and John hadn't made the full connection about the significance of what they had just saw. They had not connected what they had just saw to what Jesus had told them or what the Old Testament prophets had said. John's honesty about the uncertainty of Scripture here proves that, that he, was, he was very transparent. Uh, most people wouldn't admit uh, especially when they're writing scripture that they didn't didn't remember or didn't know what the scripture said but he offered a transparent look into his thought into his feelings and and he validated the reliability of this account of Jesus's resurrection John 20 19 through 23 we're going to skip down to, to those verses but I would advise you to go back and read this whole chapter and, and of, of John's account of the resurrection it said, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then, there were, then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so I send you. And when they had, he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. While Peter and John may have wondered about what they saw in the tomb, their understanding would grow before the day was over. You see, John noted that several disciples were, were gathered together. They were assembled on that Sunday evening. It's likely they were uh, they were meeting together because of the they had heard about the events of the day, um, and they were gathered there. It's probably were gathered at the same place. There's there's nothing to in biblically to prove this I, I, that that I know of, but uh, they were. It's thought that they were gathered at the same place where they had uh, observed the Passover uh, just a few nights before. Regardless, John emphasized that. The doors where they were at were shut and they were locked because they were in fear of the Jews. They had seen Jesus' enemies come to him at night and, and capture him and take him off and crucify him and give him an unfair uh, uh, verdict of, of being guilty of being king of the Jews. And they had crucified him. Uh, even those who hadn't seen the God got the first hand certainly heard about the incredible suffering that Jesus had and how he had endured uh, all this suffering and the pain and the death at the hands of the Roman soldiers. As Jesus' his closest followers, they were afraid because if they had been the ones who were accused of stealing the body, because that's who the Roman government said that the, maybe it was his followers that stole the body out of the grave, then who do you think they would be looking for first? They would be looking for these disciples. So these disciples were were afraid, and they were uh, hiding they were they were jesus's closest friends and they did not want, want to suffer the same fate that jesus had had suffered the fact that jesus's body was missing caused him even more fear um the sanhedrin wanted to make an example of anyone who had stolen the body and normally it would start with jesus's closest followers so i'm sure they were afraid that that the sanhedrin and the government and the romans were looking for them looking for them to to uh contemplate with them and to accuse them of stealing the body of Christ from the grave. They had the doors locked and they had fearful hearts and then, and then and all of a sudden the resurrected Jesus Christ himself stood in their midst. He didn't go have to unlock the door. He didn't have to go through a window. He didn't have to do any of that thing. He appeared. The explanation for the empty tomb was looking them directly in the eyes and offering them peace. In Jewish thought peace was a common welcome but it also included a sense of wellness that it affected everyone's spirit every aspect of life it affected what the 
Hebrews, it was, it was what the Hebrews would say when they would come to someone. They would say, Shalom, peace. The disciples needed peace because it, this, their fears were overwhelming. They were afraid. They were being overwhelmed by the fears. They weren't sure how, how they would survive. And when the Jesus appeared to them, they weren't sure how he would deal with them because they had run away and left him, because they had went and, and scattered like cowards on the night of, that he was arrested and captured. But Jesus was saying, peace. He let them know that everything would be all right. In verse 20, he said, And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. There were the disciples. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. You see, with his, with his arrival and with his presence there, Jesus provided the word peace, and then he provided the next great evidence of the resurrection, and that was the, 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 the scars in his hands and in his side and in his feet. Along with the empty tomb now, they saw their Christ, their, their Jesus, who was standing before them, showing them the scars that he had from, from the crucifixion. When they saw firsthand that, that it was him, when they saw firsthand that he was not a ghost, then Jesus, uh, they, they were happy and they accepted Jesus. The Lord, uh, they knew the one who had conquered death and the grave. They knew that this was Jesus Christ. And in, in Luke's gospel, he noticed that Jesus gave them additional proof by sharing food with them. Uh, Jesus would say, uh, there in Luke twenty four thirty seven, it says that. But for, they were startled, frightened, and thought they saw a spirit. But Jesus proved that he was the ghost. In verse forty one and forty three, it says, "Have you anything to eat?" This gave them a, a a they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he ate this fish. So so Jesus not only was not a ghost, and and he he still was a person with a body, with flesh and bones, and he ate. And he proved to them that he was not just a spirit. Uh, the disciples were ecstatic. John used the word that they were glad. That was their response. On the night before the crucifixion, Jesus had encouraged them to avoid to let their hearts be dismayed. And now their sadness and fear had turned to joy. Their sadness and fear had turned into celebration. This demonstrates the power of a changed life. This demonstrates the power of a changed life. You see, just like today, Jesus Christ doesn't want us just to have an experience. He doesn't want us just to, to experience him, but he wants us to, to, uh, to, to have a changed life, much like the disciples did. People today can still experience the spiritual uh, renewal of Jesus that he accomplished in the lives of the disciples. We can experience that today. We can experience the, the, the transformation that only Jesus Christ can do in our life. Uh, the transformation on that day that the disciples experienced when they no longer thought that they were uh, their that their savior had been killed, but they saw that their savior had arisen from the grave and that he was the Messiah and he was the true and living God who had come to walk with them and now he had defeated death and the grave. Verse twenty one says after his uh, it says then Jesus said again unto them again peace be unto you as my, as my father has sent me. Even I send you. His followers had examined his scars, and Jesus repeated his blessings of peace to them. He spoke, initially, he spoke of his peace to uh, the word peace, to bring peace to them, to, to uh, calm their fears and calm their anxieties and worries. He was assuring them that everything was going to be all right, but here he offered peace as an introduction to the commission that he was about to give them. The reunion with his disciples was was interesting and it was meaningful, but it's only part of the history. You see, uh, Jesus didn't want his experience, his his just to give his followers an experience. And he told them that as the Father had sent him to the world, even so I send you. Jesus didn't give his disciples a new mission. He simply gave them the mission to carry out what he had come and what he had started to continue the, the, what he had started. And he gives each one of us that are called to him as his children that same mission today. We are his disciples. We are to go and make disciples. And we are to baptize in his name. And we are to, to tell others about him. 
So it's not a new mission. We're on the same mission field that Jesus was on when, in the same mission that Jesus had when he was here, that others could come to know him as their Lord and Savior. And that's why I teach this Sunday school lesson week in and week out. And that's why our pastors and preachers around the world stand in the pulpit and proclaim the word. That's why on Easter Sunday we celebrate the resurrection so that someone may come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's carrying out the mission that Jesus gave us and that Jesus gave to his disciples here. Jesus had come, and he offered the only perfect sacrifice. Of course, the disciples could not offer a sacrifice for the people, but the people could lead, the disciples could lead people to Christ, who was the perfect sacrifice. Uh, we cannot be, live and fulfill a perfect sacrifice. We couldn't even, we tried to. Jesus was the only one. But we can lead people to Jesus Christ. We can lead people to the one who did live a perfect life who was the perfect lamb of God, who was slain for our sins and who, who went to the grave and then he arose again to give us uh, eternity with him, salvation. Jesus wanted them to focus on spreading his message and that's what he wants us to do today. The message that the kingdom of God had arrived, the message that the kingdom of God is near, the message that, that we can have uh, a security that we can have eternal security with him if we'll just trust and believe. Verses 22 and 23, it says that, um, and, when he, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive you the Holy Ghost. And whosoever, whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Jesus breathed on them, um, this this reminds us of, of Jesus's of God's work in creating man, the first man, Adam, that Jesus breathed life into that man. Adam had a lifeless body that God had created from the dust, and then he breathed life into that man. Uh, both were, uh, as Jesus breathed life here into the disciples, as he breathed into them the Holy Ghost, it gave them life that they could fulfill what he had called them to do. The, this was Jesus' act of passing his power and his authority to the followers through the Holy Ghost. Jesus relied on the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit the whole time he was here on earth. The Spirit had covered Jesus at his baptism, and the Spirit was with him and had directed him into the wilderness. And on the night of, uh, he was arrested, Jesus reminded the Spirit that reminded the disciples that the Spirit would lead them once he returned to the Father. So now he commanded his disciples to receive this Holy Spirit. Jesus was providing the disciples with the two, their most important two that they would have in order to tell others about Christ. And when we accept Christ as our Savior, when we become his child, we accept him by faith, and we repent of our sins, and we turn from our evil ways and turn towards Christ, then we are filled with the Holy Spirit. At that moment, we are filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit guides us in being able to tell others about Him. That's why we can go to places that, and, and talk to people that we don't know and share with people that we, we've never met. We can share with them what Jesus Christ has said because it's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that leads us to do that. Uh, Jesus gave them this tool, and we have that tool today. If you're a Christian, you have that same tool, the Holy Spirit that resides within you. Verse 21 introduces the mission. Verse 22 identifies a method. And verse 23 explains the nature of the method. Uh, we should not believe that Jesus was given his, his, his followers the authority to remit or retain sin. That power rests solely on God. Yet Jesus was, was giving them the, the power to, to proclaim the forgiveness of sin. What Paul called justification by sharing the gospel, by faithfully witnessing uh, to the work of Christ, they, they leave sinners with a clear choice, a choice to make. And that's what we do is we lead people to Christ and we leave them with a choice to make. We can't make that choice for them. If we could, uh, then everybody that I know, if I can make the choice for them, they would be saved. They would be saved from a, from a, a, a terrible death and, and a terrible eternity in hell. They would be saved from that if it was my choice but it's not my choice every man makes a choice and whatever choice there's a circumstance 
The choice for choosing Christ is, is eternity in heaven with him. The choice for rejecting Christ is eternity in hell, in an everlasting hell fire. So unbelievers know where they stand with God. When they decide for themselves what direction to take, then they have made that choice. Uh, it's our privilege. It's our heart. It's our desire that we, that we lead them to the cross and that they make the right choice. We lead them to the gospel. We share, share with them the gospel. We let people know they can be forgiven no matter what sin it is. There's no sin too great for God to forgive. We lead them to that place and we pray for them that they would make the correct choice, but we can't make the choice for them. We move on to John 20, verses 27 through 29. And it says, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but be believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen me, and yet have believed. You see, we the verses we skipped here, uh, it, it talks about Thomas. And Thomas was not there with the disciples uh, when Jesus came to him the first time. But, but Thomas was there uh, at, at this meeting where, where, uh, where Jesus came. And he said, Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but be believing. Thomas uh, was, had doubted and a lot of times we use the word doubting Thomas uh, even outside of biblical instances. But he, he needed more than just somebody telling him. And, um, you know, we can say that was lack of faith, but, but we don't know all the circumstances in Thomas's life, so I try not to judge, but, but he needed to see the scars for himself, according to John 20, verses 24 through 25. And a week later, Thomas got that chance. On following Sunday, Jesus' followers again gathered there and probably in that same upper room, probably in that same place. Uh, this time, Thomas was present. The doors were probably locked again, and Jesus appeared once again with a welcome of peace. And then the Savior went straight to Thomas. Now, the other disciples had seen Jesus' hands and his feet and his side before, and now Jesus gave Thomas that same opportunity. The Lord never called out Thomas for his doubts. Instead, he simply encouraged him. He encouraged the skeptical disciple to reach forth his finger and, and touch the nail scars in his hand, to reach forth his hand and, and thrust it into the side where the spear had went into the side. Jesus met Thomas exactly where he was living, and he provided him with all the evidence that he demanded. You see, Jesus loved Thomas that much, and he gave him the evidence, all the evidence he would ever need to trust and believe in him. Today, we have to trust and believe in Christ, and we don't have the, the evidence that Thomas had of being able to touch his scars of his fingers or thrust our hands aside, but we have evidence of the Scripture that Thomas didn't have. We have the documented uh, Scripture of, of those who were with him. We have the, the uh, God-inspired Scripture that, that we can share with others to tell them about Jesus Christ. And once Jesus saw once Thomas had seen Jesus for himself, Jesus said, Be thou not faithless, but believe. We gotta have stop doubting the way that Thomas doubted. We need to get people to stop doubting the the reality that Jesus Christ is our Savior, but to believe and to have faith. Belief and disbelief are both active decisions that people make. So we have to to lead people to make the choices that would lead them to eternity with Christ. Jesus urged Thomas to lean into to the spiritual and not just the, the everyday examples. He was issuing the same challenge to each of us today. Jesus said, um, and Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, there in verse 28, Thomas' doubts were transformed into worship. He used two specific titles for Jesus. My Lord, my God. He realized that this was 
uh, Jesus, the Messiah. His emphasis on these words emphasized that he was Jesus, the Messiah. It was a submission to Christ, his confession of Jesus' deity. He wasn't just worshiping a teacher or a rabbi, but he was worshiping his Savior and his God because he realized that this Savior and this God had been had been resurrected from the grave and now stood before him. Some have suggested that Thomas changed because Jesus knew what he had told the other disciples in private, that Thomas should have changed because what he heard for them. But the key to a doubter's transformation is a personal encounter with the risen Savior. And anyone who's experienced Jesus in his own life can understand this. And if, and, and if you will open your hearts to Christ, if you will just accept him and believe him he will change your life forever you will have that personal encounter uh not that you'll be able to touch his hands and feet but that he will change your life he will rock your world that you'll never be the same so so i urge you today to trust jesus trust him and believe verse 29 uh said that jesus said unto him thomas because thou hast seen me thou hast believed Blessed are they that have seen and have not yet believed, and have, have yet believed. Jesus was glad Thomas believed him. Jesus said that you saw me and you believe, but blessed are those who have not seen, but yet have believed. That describes all the, the people who have lived throughout the ages. You see, God, Jesus had commissioned his disciples to carry the word, to spread the gospel, uh, but to many and, and everybody that they would see, but most of the people would uh, that they spread the, the word to never saw Jesus personally. Uh, within a century, all eyewitnesses of Jesus were died out and gone. So, but people com were still were still committed to believe and to serve Jesus Christ. All they all they needed to hear was that they were blessed for their faith. It's easy to criticize Thomas for skepticism. In fact, uh, it's even the strongest Christians have questions, and that's okay. Jesus is okay with that. Doubt can actually be healthy when it drives us toward Christ. When it challenges us to evaluate what we really believe, it can be healthy. But doubts can lead us also lead us to a deeper knowledge of Jesus Christ. If we would just search the scriptures to learn more about him, if we would just pray to God and learn more about him and let him speak in their life, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and by believing in him, we, even without seeing him, we can have eternal life. You see, we have not seen the risen, risen Jesus yet, yet we place our faith in him. God blessed us by forgiveness of our sins and given us the spirit of, a burn, of a, an abundance of eternal life. Romans 10, 9 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the gospel. For with the heart one believeth and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So the Bible tells us that if we would believe and and, and accept him into our life and then confess him with our mouth that he is our savior then we can be saved jesus raised god raises jesus from the dead and thereby de declaring that jesus's sacrifice that he made the death on the cross was acceptable for all the sins of the world for all the sins of the people who were would be born uh his sacrifice was acceptable the resurrection of christ guarantees our salvation including our future resurrection into our eternal life. The Bible reminds us that we can we can have a all have a deep that we have a deep spiritual need that only God can fill and only God can meet. But however God has met that need through Jesus Christ and he sent his son to die for us for our sins and through him we can we can have a peace uh, that and an understanding that surpasses all understand, other understanding. Uh, as we repent of our sins and we place our faith in Jesus Christ, he forgives us our sin and he begins to transform our life and, and, and he turns us into the people that he's created us to be. So my question to you today was, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? What a glorious day it would be to accept Christ on Easter Sunday when he arose from the grave after he died for your sins and for my sins 
And, and he is the only way to salvation. Faith in him is the only way to salvation. I beg you today and I plead with you today that if you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior, that today would be the day of salvation for you. And that you would not wait another minute, another let, don't let another second pass by without falling on your knees and calling out to him. And you don't need me there. You don't need a preacher there. You just need to trust Jesus and believe in him. And then get in his word and read about him. Or you can call any a church where the Bible is preached and, and talk to someone there. I'd be glad to talk with you if you wanted to contact us here at Whitefield Baptist Church and, and ask for me. Our, our, our numbers are on the website. You can contact us, and I'd be glad to talk with you and pray with you. But just know this, that, that Jesus Christ loved you more than I could ever love you. Jesus Christ loved you enough to give his own life for you, that you could be forgiven of your sins if you would just trust in him and believe and repent and turn from the wicked ways of the world and turn towards him. I just pray that you would do that today. And for us that, that are Christians, that we know that we, we fail him, quite often. We have sin in our life. We have things in our life that, that, that interrupt us. What a glorious day it would be today on Easter Sunday just to to reunite, reunite ourselves with him, to re-engage with him. If we've been slack in reading our, the Bible, if we've been slack in our prayer time, if we've been slack in our faith, if we worry, if we, if we have all this anxiety, let's turn to Christ today. Let's draw closer to him and he will draw closer to us. And let's trust him and let's renew our commitment to him. Let him renew a new spirit in us that we would be able to serve him, that we'll be able to carry on the mission that he started, that we can tell the world about Jesus Christ and how the, he can save the world if people would just turn to him. But remember this, everyone, this is a choice. We make those choices every day. We make a choice to follow Christ or to turn against him every day. My prayer is that you would make the choice of following Christ a reality in your life and everything that you do and everything that you say. I pray for you today, and I pray that you would pray for me and pray for our church. Our church loves you. If you don't have a home church, Whitefield Baptist Church is a loving, God-fearing God church where the word is preached and taught and where, where we are encouraged to love God and to love others. I just pray today that, that uh, this message has reached you and touched you in some way. And I want to close with prayer today. And, uh, and I pray that uh, you will have a great week. And I pray that, if, uh, that you would have a renewed uh, spirit with Jesus Christ today. And that uh, he would be more real in your life than he ever has been. Let's pray. God, I do thank you, Father, for this day. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come and to speak uh, today, Father, to teach your word. Father, the greatest uh, lesson that, that we can ever share is the resurrection of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, that we could have salvation and that we could have a life eternal with you in the heavens. Lord, I'm, I'm so grateful that Christ defeated the sin. He defeated death and he defeated the grave. And Lord, on our own, we are lost and we're without hope. But Father, because of your son, we have hope, a hope everlasting, a real hope, a hope that we can cling to. And today, Lord, I pray that if there be one that doesn't know you today would be the day of salvation. Lord, I pray for, for all of our our, our listeners, Father, if they are members of this church or another church, Father, I pray that today would be a renewing of your spirit with you, Father, that they would today be more committed to serve you than they ever have in the past. And Lord, I just pray today that you would have been glorified in these words. Father, I pray that uh, if I mess anything up, you'd forgive me. I pray that you would remove me today, Lord, that the people could hear your word and they could hear you and that your name would be glorified. And Lord, it's in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, that I pray. Amen. Well, again, thank you for being with us, and I'll see you next week. God bless you.